Good morning, or I guess good evening for some of you, um, and welcome to our conversation about low vision management for patients with visual field loss. Um, our conversation today is really going to focus on patients with more concentric visual field loss than on hemianopias or other etiologies, but we'll touch on those a bit. Um, we're going to start out with a brief overview of some of the concepts surrounding management for patients with visual field loss, and then we'll spend most of our time together today discussing specific cases I've seen in the recent clinical past um, and talking about low vision management in these particular cases and highlight some of the principles we'll discuss. So, you know, I think first of all, it's important to note that visual field loss occurs in a number of different ocular conditions for a number of different reasons. These can include retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. They can include optic nerve related diseases like optic atrophy and glaucoma, or they can happen due to neurological problems like in patients with hemianopia. It's important to accurately and reliable assess visual fields in these patients, of course, so that we can understand what type of field loss they have and how it might impact their function. Um, standardly, we do confrontation visual fields on every patient where we show fingers off to the side and ask the patient how many fingers are seen. And this gives us a gross assessment of patients' peripheral vision and the extent of their field loss. We can also use more formal perimetry techniques like Humphrey visual fields, um, where patients are placed in this machine that presents lights to them and they indicate when they see a light. Um, and this really allows us to compare visual field measurements over time with a high level of detail. There are also other kinetic visual field tests that we can do with standardized equipment, um, such as the Goldman visual fields, or a, which is a kinetic visual field test where patients, again, press the button when they see a light. But here, the examiner controls the light, not the machine. So it allows us to be a little bit more um, varied in our presentation of targets. In patients with visual field loss, there are certain complaints that are more common. Uh, patients might report that they often lose their place when reading. Um, they might report missing things off to the side where, you know, if they're not looking directly at something, they have to really move their eyes around to find it. They might say that they can't see things until they're directly in front of them. And this can kind of translate into a jack-in-the-box effect, especially in patients with hemianopia, where if they are, they're walking along, they might not see something off to the side until it's right in front of them. And then it kind of pops into their view and they all of a sudden see it and they need to respond to it. Patients might report difficulty localizing objects and locating them in their environment. So if they drop something, it's difficult for them to find it. They also might report difficulty with mobility. They might have more frequent trips or bumping into things, or they may even have some falls related to not seeing things in their environment and then losing their footing. Driving can also be a significant concern in patients with visual field loss, and um, many states in America do not allow patients to drive uh, if they have significant field loss. So knowing these functional complaints that are common in patients, you know, these are most often elicited during the functional case history portion of a low vision exam. Uh, I'm seeing that people cannot see the screen. Is this correct? Hi, Dr. Govell. I think we can see your screen, so I'll um, work on this ticket as it is. Great. Thanks so much, Andy. All right. Uh, so during a low vision exam, um, there are a number of different elements that we kind of go through in the course. So first, we'll do a functional case history where we typically are picking up on those different functional complaints that we discussed on the last slide with mobility concerns and difficulty bumping into things. And there are specific areas within a low vision functional history that I often address. So during a case history, we want to get a chief complaint. Um, here we find out exactly what the patient is hoping to get from their low vision exam with the hopes that we can address that problem on that visit. Um, we then ask about difficulty reading 
and we try to be quite detailed about this. We might ask patients if they're having difficulty reading medication labels or books or newspapers or food packaging. And all of these different activities have different requirements and patients may have different preferences about how they go about performing these activities. Another type of reading that I'll often ask about as well is technology. So I want to know if patients use computers or tablets or smartphones. And if they do, I want to know if those patients are using any specific adaptations to make them easier to use. And if not, I might have some recommendations about how to use these devices as well. Uh, I also ask patients about general seeing, if they're having trouble reading signs or seeing the TV if they've ever worn distance glasses and if they find distance glasses helpful and those types of activities. We'll also ask about mobility. And this is a really important one in our patients with visual field loss. Here, I ask patients if they've had any trips or bumps or if they've fallen or if they're concerned about any of these things. Sometimes our patients with significant mobility will restrict their activities in order to reduce the likelihood that they have these problems. And that can be a problem in and of itself because if patients aren't going out and about, this is really limiting their quality of life. I also ask patients about their daily living activities. If they're able to do their cooking and their cleaning and take care of their laundry and their home environment, I wanna know if they can manage their medications independently and tell their pills apart. Um, for younger students, I'll also ask about work or school and if they're having any difficulty there. And for hobbies, you know, we wanna know if these patients have any other important activities that they do in their day-to-day -day life. So we take a really detailed and comprehensive functional low vision history during a low vision exam, which is a bit different from our usual, you know, eye exam history. After we've gone through our full history, um, we do entrance testing and some of our entrance tests are the same as usual. We'll do extraocular motilities and we'll evaluate pupils and we'll do confrontation visual fields, but there are some tests that are a bit different. So first we do visual field, visual acuity testing. And the way that we do this can be different from a primary care eye exam. Here we can use special charts for low vision patients that can be used at a closer working distance, which allows us to get a more accurate measurement of visual acuity. So quite often I'll see patients who are marked down as having hand motion vision from a different provider. But then when we see them in the low vision clinic where we have all these additional tools to evaluate vision, we can get an actual measurement of the vision, which can be important for finding appropriate refractive findings or recommending devices accurately, or even just giving a patient a sense that they do in fact have some vision in their worst seeing eye. We next evaluate contrast sensitivity. Most of our world isn't really black on white like a standard acuity chart, so contrast is important to assess how patients perform in these real-world conditions where things aren't perfect contrast. Uh, so they start with these nice dark letters, and then as they go on through the test, the letters get more and more faded, and this allows us with a clue as to how that patient might function. We also evaluate reading using special continuous text reading charts that have full sentences of words. And this can be really useful, especially when we're evaluating devices, because it gives a more real world assessment of reading performance than just a near acuity test. So it gives us a better sense of whether patients are missing certain elements of the words, if they're missing the first or the last part of the word or the middle part of the word, it might suggest something about the patient's function and how we can intervene to help. After this, we go ahead and do a trial frame refraction to make sure that the patient's vision is corrected to the best that it can be corrected. And finally, we evaluate different low vision devices and technologies based on all of the exam findings that we've gotten so far, including the acuity, the contrast, and our functional history. So low vision management for patients with visual field loss follows the same format that we've discussed, and we 
go ahead and evaluate many of the same devices that are evaluated in patients with central field loss if necessary. But there are certain uh, things that we might do for patients with field loss that are more specific to field loss. Um, for patients with visual field constriction, minifiers or reverse telescopes can reduce the size of the image that patients see in order to see more at the same time. So we know that anytime we're using a magnifier or a telescope, there's a trade-off between magnification and field of view. So the idea here is that we expand field of view at the expense of magnification. We shrink things down so we can see more at a time. We can also use peripheral prisms or pelly prisms for patients with hemianopia. Um, these are known to expand the visual field. There are tiny segments of prism that shift things towards the uh, seeing field from the non-seeing field. And we fit them in front of just one eye. And while this is kind of beyond the scope of what we're discussing today with concentric visual field loss, I would feel remiss to not at least mention it. Um, if acuity is reduced in our patients with visual field loss, we also need to prescribe magnification. And we need to do this very carefully because if we over magnify, patients will only see a little bit at a time. And with that field of view and magnification trade off, if we magnify too much, fields of view will be too small. And in a patient with very constricted visual fields, they might only get a fraction of a letter at a time, which can make for very difficult reading. Other considerations in patients with visual field loss revolve around training. So some patients with field loss will require scanning training in order to develop systematic strategies to locate and find things in the environment and to move their eyes in a specific pattern to localize items. Patients may also require orientation and mobility training where they learn non-visual skills to compensate for their visual field loss and kind of better get around and function and find their way when they're out and about. And we'll touch more on orientation and mobility training throughout our cases, but I think for now, we're ready to kind of jump into our first case for a patient with visual field loss and their unique functional needs. So for our first case, we have a 49-year-old female coming in for her annual low vision exam. She has a history of optic nerve hypoplasia with nystagmus and strabismus. And at this visit, she's telling us that she feels like her vision is worsened and she's more often bumping into things. This is surprising because optic nerve hypoplasia is a congenital condition that we expect to remain roughly stable throughout life from bismuth and nystagmus for many, many years. So these are not new findings. And the optic nerve hypoplasia should be stable in terms of level of vision. We expanded on our functional history further. We learned that from a vocational perspective, our patient works as a mental health counselor. She has extensive commuter, computer demands, especially related to her use of the electronic health records. She's able to complete her work and do what she needs to do at work, but she notes that her eyes get tired by the end of the day, despite her use of built-in computer accessibility functions, which can make things look larger on the screen. Our patient also reports that when reading, she does have trouble tracking her place, especially when reading with prism half eyes that she uses, which are strong reading glasses with prism built into them with the base in so that it shifts the image out so that there's less convergence demand for the patient while reading. So while this patient is reading with them, she's having more trouble keeping her place and she does not note that glasses are helpful on the computer. In terms of mobility, our patient notes that she is having more and more trouble and that she's finding herself bumping into things more often. She had orientation and mobility instruction nine years ago and was trained on how to use a white cane, but she really is starting to struggle more and more now, even though she's almost 50 years old. Uh, she notes that most of the time she does well with her daily living activities. She has no difficulty with medication management and cleaning. Most of the time she's able to do quite well with her cooking, although she does note that she recently cut her finger when she was cutting things using a mandolin, but she felt like this was kind of an isolated incident. As 
at this point, she has a few devices in place. Um, she is using prism half eye reading glasses. So these are seven diopters with nine prism diopters base in in front of each eye. So that base in prism shifts the image out to reduce convergence demand. She also uses audiobooks for pleasure reading, and she has a white cane that she'll occasionally use for different mobility activities. So next, I'm going to ask a poll question. Um, so which of the following functional complaints that our first case reported are most common in patients with visual field loss? Um, is it difficulty reading and keeping her place, frequent trips or bumps, a need for higher amounts of magnification, distance glasses resolving the problem, or is it a certain combination of the above? All right, great. So many of us picked A and B, difficulty keeping her place in frequent trips and bumps. And most of us who didn't pick the combination um, chose at least one of those things. So I think we are all on the same page here. So moving on with our exam, we've completed our functional history and now we want to examine this patient. Her distance acuities are 20, 320 in the right eye. 20, 1200 in the left eye, and 20, 320 with both eyes together. Her near acuities are 0.4 over 2.5 M, and she's observed tilting her head back while reading. Her pupils are normally reactive. Uh, her ocular motilities were examined, and while they were accurate, full, and nystagmus, she was also observed to have a jerk nystagmus with the cyclorotary component. So her nystagmus had a fast and a slow phase, and there was also kind of a circular movement with the eye nystagmus. Um, the patient was observed to have a null point in convergence, which we thought was interesting. Uh, we did confrontation visual fields on here, her, which revealed severe constriction 360 degrees. And we also did facial fields where we have the patient sit 33 centimeters away from us and ask the patient to look at our face. And we ask if any parts of their view are grayed out, missing, or distorted. If they're missing elements centrally, like my nose or my eye, they might that might indicate a central scotoma. Whereas if patients are missing edges of their view, like if they can't see my chin or my forehead or my ears, that might su suggest some pretty significant field loss. So fortunately, our patient's facial fields were full. We also evaluated contrast sensitivity using the MARS contrast sensitivity test pictured here. And our patient read to 0.96 log CS using both eyes together, which is that letter highlighted by the red box on the screen. And this is categorized as a severe contrast sensitivity deficit. We moved on to trial frame refraction, which yielded no subjective or objective improvement in this case at this time. And we next evaluated our patient's reading. So we used our continuous text card and we asked the patient to start at the top and read down as quickly and accurately as she could. Um, using a close working distance, she was able to read down to 2.5 M uh, with good speed and accuracy. So the critical print size is the last line at which the patient read with good speed and accuracy. And then beyond that line, the patient started to really slow down with her reading and she could not read any further than the 1.3 M line. So the patient's critical print size suggested that she was comfortable reading at 2.5 M, which is about two and a half times the size of newspaper print and she couldn't read any further than 1.3 M, which is a little bit bigger than the size of newspaper print. We moved on to evaluate some devices. So we started with her existing reading glasses, her plus seven with nine base in prism readers. With this device, she was able to make it to a 1.6 M threshold. And with another diopter over it, she was able to read to a 1.3 M threshold. Uh, so it was a little bit improved with a little bit stronger reading glass, although still not quite reaching that 1M newspaper-sized print target. 
our patient was not motivated to obtain these PRISM readers at this visit, and she wanted to kind of forego any further device evaluation at this point because she was concerned about her subjective worsening of visual field. So next, we did Goldman perimetry on this patient. Um, here we can see uh, the Goldman perimetry findings. So for those of you who may not see or do Goldman perimetry very often, um, the lines show what was seen when a patient was shown a specific sized light. So in this particular case, um, those three lines were drawn at separate times. So the black line indicates the patient's responses when the largest target light was brought from non-seeing to seeing visual field, and the patient was asked to press the button when they saw the light. The red line is when the same test was done, but using a smaller light target. And then the green line is when the same test was done yet again, but using a still smaller target. So this was done with a frosted occluder, and we confirmed that the patient could not see the target with the other eye. And we wanted to use a frosted occluder because with our patient's significant nystagmus, she might have more difficulty if we cover one eye, where if there's a latent component to the nystagmus, covering one eye can cause the nystagmus to increase, which would make the test more difficult. During testing, we saw that the patient's fixation did vary related to her nystagmus, but overall she was good and reliable and consistent in maintaining her place and she had greater trouble with the smaller isopters or the smaller target presentations that we tested. Fortunately, these visual, find, visual field findings proved to be stable to her last exam. So we moved on to do a dilated eye exam on our patient. Um, fortunately, there were no concerning findings. She did have a small optic nerve with a double ring sign and a cup to disc ratio of 0.1 round. Um, so you can see a representation of that image over here where the patient has a teeny tiny optic nerve. And then you can see large scleral crescents and kind of the area that would be filled in with the optic nerve had her optic nerve developed normally. So we were pleased to note that there was no additional ocular pathology at this visit um, that our patient would need to be concerned about. So our plan at this time was that to first and foremost, reassure the patient on the stability of her visual field testing and the lack of new ocular pathology. Um, fortunately for this patient, we had no additional findings. We didn't need to worry about her having new eye problems. Um, she just felt like she was functioning worse. So while we're very glad that she doesn't have new pathology that we need to address, we do need to make sure that we do all that we can to improve her function. So next, we recommended updated orientation and mobility training. Our patient told us that she's having trouble with tripping over things and bumping into things and having a great deal more difficulty. So updating her strategies that were put in place nine years ago should be helpful for her. We also felt that it would be worth considering stronger or different readers to reduce her strain with computer demands. And our patient decided that we could revisit that at a follow-up visit because we'd already spent quite a bit of time evaluating her and she was pretty fatigued after all of this testing. So orientation and mobility is the topic I'd like to talk about a little bit further now. Orientation and mobility training here where I practice in the United States is directed by a certified orientation and mobility specialist, and it teaches non-visual skills for navigating the environment, which we refer to as mobility, as well as strategies for understanding your position in space and how to make your way through it, which is the orientation piece. So the mobility relates to the patient actively moving through space, while the orientation relates more to the patient finding their way and kind of constructing mental maps and finding their way through it. There are a number of different strategies that might be used in orientation and mobility training. 
The simplest is sighted or human guide where the patient has a helper or a caregiver who they are able to depend on to get around. And there are specific strategies that the patient can learn that provide better support and better posture and help the patient get around more effectively. Um, Patients might also be trained to use a long white mobility cane, and they can use this to sweep the ground in front of them to detect changes in threshold and low-lying obstacles so that if there's something that they're likely to trip over, they can plan accordingly and adjust. There are also different kind of echoes and feelings in how that cane is swept across the ground that that patient can use to understand their orientation in space. They can tell if they're going from one type of flooring to another or detect patterns in how they're getting around in their usual environments. They can develop strategies to plan their routes. Uh, the trainer might help integrate different low vision devices. So if a patient appreciated a reverse telescope or a specific filter, it might be useful to have some training on these devices in their day-to-day -day activities. And there's so many more things that these orientation and mobility instructors will do with their low vision patients with field loss. So it's pretty comprehensive and it's crucial for our patients, especially our uh, visual field loss patients who often report trips, bumps, falls, and other mobility concerns. I think when we talk about orientation and mobility training, people often want to know, when do I refer? Who do I refer? What's the cutoff? And the trick here is that it's not necessarily what you might expect. Uh, so this paper found that potential mobility difficulties can occur in patients with a visual field as large as 70 degrees diameter, which is almost half of the visual field, which, you know, for most clinicians, would be surprised by this. It's rather a large field. Um, and an assessment for mobility rehab is really warranted when the field is between 30 and 50 degrees. So for us, patients come in and they might tell us that they're having mobility concerns. And I think that with how wide the field diameters in the study were that indicated referral for orientation and mobility training, a good takeaway is that we should ask our patients if they're having new trouble getting around related to their vision. And if they are, that's a clear indication that they should be referred for orientation and mobility training. So for our particular patient that we're discussing, she has existing orientation and mobility cane skills from her training that was done nine years ago, but her function seems to have changed despite the stable vision and ocular health. So based on this change in how she's functioning, she is worth getting a referral to orientation and mobility to update her existing strategies. So fortunately, I recently saw this patient for a follow-up and she was so pleased to tell us that her refresher orientation and mobility instruction happened and she was doing so much better. Um, she was relieved that she wasn't tripping or bumping into things anymore. And she said, you know, I knew how to use that cane, but boy, do I use it better now that I've had this additional training. So she was really thriving with her mobility skills. However, she had broken her reading glasses, so she was ready to revisit this activity and find a new set. At this follow-up visit, our patient's vision was nice and stable from previous Um we saw her 2320 vision in the right eye and with both eyes in 201200 in the left. Um, she had nystagmus that was nice and stable. She still had her severe contrast sensitivity deficit. And at this visit, a refraction did yield some very mild improvement in vision. And she felt that she did prefer the small um, astigmatism correction that we detected on this exam. We moved on to evaluate her reading um, using the manifest refraction that we found at that visit with a plus six add over the refraction. We were actually surprised to see that our patient did a little bit better than at that last visit with a smaller critical print size of 2M and a smaller, a similar threshold actually at 1.3M. 
We then evaluated different options for reading. Uh, with a plus eight ad, our patient had trouble and she her reading seemed slow and strained. But with a weaker ad, she had better fluency and preferred this than the plus eight. She also preferred this plus six ad without any prism, feeling that her eyes weren't working as hard without the prism. So at this visit, we updated the patient's distance glasses as well as her reading glasses. And at this visit, she felt that she would be best served if we skipped the prism in her strong reading glasses. It seemed likely that given her nystagmus null point in convergence, pulling reading material very close was actually helpful because it allowed her to more easily adopt her null point, whereas base and prism would result in her needing to induce less convergence, which would have less of an impact on her nystagmus. Additionally, we used a weaker reading prescription at this visit than she'd previously been accustomed to wearing. So this is another example of a case where over magnifying can be problematic and for patients with field loss, sometimes less magnification is more. Uh, at the end of this visit, we also recommended continued use of orientation and mobility strategies and we were quite pleased with how she was doing with her cane skills. So from this case, it really highlights the importance of orientation and mobility instruction for patients with field loss and really maintaining that level of performance throughout the lifespan. This patient has probably been using a cane since she was a child, and here she is at almost 50 years old, still learning and growing and developing new strategies. So sometimes orientation and mobility training is not a one-time occurrence. It's something that sometimes needs to be refreshed over time. We also noted a few additional considerations in this case. First, we ensured the stability of ocular health for a patient with apparently progressive condition. Um, we also recommended glasses and low vision devices as appropriate. It's important for our patients with field loss that we provide the best refractive correction to maximize central vision and give the patients the best potential for viewing. And we also need to be careful not to over magnify patients because if we provide too much magnification in a small field of view, this can be really prohibitive for our field loss patients. Our next case is a 75 year old female who's presenting for a low vision exam with a history of proliferative diabetic retinopathy with a retinal detachment in the left eye and an ocular prosthesis in the right. At this visit, she's hoping to improve her independence in performing daily living activities. She notes difficulty doing crossword puzzles, reading. She's having more and more mobility concerns with frequent bumps and trips. And two months ago, she had a fall. Fortunately, she was not injured at this fall. And she notes that she had a long white cane previously, but she's developed some muscular weakness and now she's leaning off to one side and she really needs a support cane, which prevents her from feeling comfortable using a long white mobility cane. She also notes that when cleaning, she's missing spots, she's burnt herself when trying to cook, and she has help for medication management, but she would like to do that more independently. She has some glare sensitivity, both indoors and outdoors. And at this visit, she only is using a lens from a broken hand magnifier. So she really doesn't have much technology or devices to help her function. Fortunately, she had recently had a dilated fundus exam with her retinal specialist. She has an ocular prosthesis in the right eye. And in the left eye, she had stable regressed proliferative diabetic retinopathy after extensive PRP treatment um, with some residual fibrovascular material, as you can see in this Optos fundus photo. Um, she had a history of retinal detachment in this eye and the eye was fortunately no longer detached. Um, and she had extensive surgical scarring in that left eye. Fortunately, all of these findings were stable, so we were free to kind of proceed with our low vision exam. At this visit, our patient had no vision, of course, in the right eye because it was an ocular prosthesis. In the left eye, she had 2200 vision um, with a sluggish pupillary response to light. 
Her ocular motilities were smooth, accurate, full, and extensive. And in that left eye, she had severe visual field constriction. Um, we did facial fields again to see how severe her constriction is and if she had any central or paracentral scotomas. Um, and her facial fields in that left eye were nice and full. We did contrast sensitivity testing on this patient, and her contrast of 0.88 log CS revealed a severe impairment, as you can see indicated on this um, chart over here by that red box. We next did a trial frame refraction, and we found some uh, compound hyperopic astigmatism, which yielded a subjective improvement in the patient's vision, and she also benefited from an ad. Uh, next, we evaluated her reading using the uh, manifest refraction in a plus 350 ad. And with this, she was able to read to 3.2 M with good speed and then to 2.5 M at the bare minimum slow struggling pace. Uh, we proceeded to evaluate different low vision devices. And this patient was particularly interested in hand magnifiers. So we started there. We started with a 24 diopter illuminated hand magnifier with which the patient could read 2.5 M. She felt like the field of view of this device was really restrictive and limiting and she didn't like it at all. So since we knew that the field of view was problematic for this patient, we walked back the magnification a step and evaluated a 20 diopter illuminated handheld magnifier. And with this device, she was able to read down to 1.25 M, and she really liked this device. She preferred it over the previous one. She felt that it was much easier to use, and she felt like it was something that she could actively use in her day-to-day -day life. We next evaluated tints, and our patient actually preferred a dark plum tint for her glare sensitivity. So at this visit, we issued a glasses prescription for full-time wear, and given the fact that our patient is monocular, we recommended impact-resistant polycarbonate lens material for protection so that if something were to hit her in that seeing eye, she'd at least have a lens to protect it. We also recommended the 20 diopter hand magnifier with which she read so well, as well as the plum filters for glare control. We recommended orientation and mobility instruction, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that's different for our second patient than for our first patient. And we also recommended some daily living skills training, and she was requiring a uh, letter stating that she was legally blind in support of some accommodations that she needed related to her apartment building. So for this particular case, orientation and mobility training needs to be modified a bit. Um, long cane training may not be feasible alone for a patient with physical comorbidities like muscle weakness. So our patient was telling us that she couldn't use that long white cane because she needed more support. So there are different ways to do this. Sometimes patients will use that long white cane in addition to different support strategies. So they might have a long white cane plus a support cane or a long white cane plus a walker. Uh, some patients aren't able to do this. For example, I had a patient the other day who had lower back pain, which precluded her from using um, devices in that hand. So she couldn't hold two canes at once, which meant that she was really using just her support cane rather than her white cane. Sometimes patients will need a walker or a rollator because it will provide preview of upcoming uh, changes in threshold. So if they're not able to sweep the floor with a long white cane, a walker at least gives them a, a preview of what's coming within the next foot. So if that walker is bumping around or going over an edge, they'll realize it and correct and, you know, figure out how to adjust. Uh, some patients will use a support cane, a short white cane or a short regular cane, just to sweep ahead a little bit or to at least feel where the next step is when they're going downstairs. Or patients might get a white support cane with a red tip, which indicates legal blindness um, and at least provides identification so that if patients are walking down a busy city street and they need support and they're also visually impaired, Others will be aware of that impairment and hopefully react in an appropriate way to not um, 
create problems. Daily living skills training is also important for this patient who is telling us about difficulties she was having with the cleaning and the cooking and her medication management needing support. Um, so there are a number of different strategies that could help a patient function with these daily living activities. Um, you can see pictured here um, a liquid level indicator that um, orange device up here on the upper right part of your screen. Um, this device can be hooked over the edge of a cup and it'll beep when it's about to overflow so that the patient isn't overfilling cups. Um, there are protective gloves that patients can wear when cutting to prevent them from cutting themselves. And some patients might depend more on using a special chopper rather than cutting things manually themselves in order to reduce that risk of cutting themselves. There are also high contrast cutting boards. So the cutting board I've pictured here is white on one side and black on the other. And patients might cut dark colored things like uh, broccoli or vegetables on one side, and they might color cut light colored things like potatoes or chicken on the other side to make it easier to see due to contrast. Um, patients might also use different customized um, marking strategies for their medications. They might label it with large print, or they might use rubber bands to indicate when they're supposed to take them. So here's our next poll question. Uh, true or false, orientation and mobility training is only useful for patients who do not have any problems stemming from musculoskeletal comorbidities like muscular weakness or arthritis. All right, great. Most of us agree. Orientation and mobility can be helpful in people even who have musculoskeletal issues that prevent their use of a standard long white cane. So from this patient, we've seen that orientation and mobility training can be appropriate in patients with physical comorbidities that affect mobility, but different approaches might be necessary. There are also other strategies that can help improve daily living activity performance, which might be compromised for patients with field loss. And it's important to continue to recommend low vision devices and glasses when it's appropriate, and always to use the minimum amount of magnification possible. All right, uh, so we have one more case today. This is a 65-year-old female presenting for a low vision exam with a history of bilateral occipital lobe infarcts following a PCA stroke. Um, her left occipital lobe cortex infarct was chronic, but she had a new right-sided infarct about a month ago. And she came to this visit with her daughter saying that she's having so much difficulty. She can't read the Bible anymore, which is really troubling to her. She is unable to do her daily living activities independently as depending on others. She hasn't had any trips, bumps, or falls, and she's using a standard cane, but she's really restricting her activities and not going out at all and barely even leaving her armchair. So she's really reduced her life space. At this point, she is also endorsing a lot of emotional difficulty relating to her adjustment to visual impairment. She's depressed. She's not eating. Her daughter's really worried about her. At this visit, her distance acuities were 20-25 in each eye. She turned her head left when reading, and she really had trouble finding those letters on the screen, although she was able to do it with enough time and help. Um, her vision did not improve any further with refraction, and she was again able to read very small print on near acuity testing, but it was very difficult. We evaluated her contrast sensitivity, which was moderately impaired at one log CS in both eyes together, as indicated by that red square on the chart. Um, her pupils were full and normal. Um, her mo eye motilities were able to get to all the places they needed to go. There was no restriction or problems like that. However, her fixation was very unstable, so she would kind of lose sight of the light target throughout testing. Uh, confrontation visual fields showed profound constriction 360 degrees in both eyes. And we can see that visual field test at that visit here. Um, we can see Humphrey visual fields print at, print at, printouts revealing 
severe profound constriction in the left eye worse than the right eye, but certainly in both, um, explaining why she is having so much trouble functioning with her vision. We next evaluated her continuous text reading, and she was able to read down to 0.4 over 4M, but she really struggled. Um, she kept losing her place. She kept reading isolated letters and getting jumbled up and lost on the page. Um, we thought about using a line guide with her to help her keep her place, but she felt so depressed and frustrated and overwhelmed to begin with that she didn't want to revisit anything that would help her keep her place for visual reading. So at this visit, we recommended orientation and mobility instruction, as we've discussed quite a bit throughout this talk, uh, to help our patient find her way despite this profoundly constricted visual field and to help her get out and about and stop limiting her activities quite so much. We also recommended daily living skills training, which might help her to find strategies to do her daily living activities more effectively and more independently. And we also recommended optical character recognition or OCR technology to use for reading. So there are a number of different devices that have this capability, and this will read things aloud for patients rather than having them need to read it visually. Um, so based on how much difficulty our patient was having with using her vision and her general level of frustration, we jumped right to having things read aloud to her. We knew that with 2025 vision and with the ability to read down to 0.4M, she was able to read small print, so making it bigger wouldn't be helpful. But finding your way around can be very frustrating when you have such a high level of feels loss. So we talked to her about different smartphone apps. Uh, so on the screen here, you can see a picture of an app called Seeing AI, which is for free on iPhones. Um, and this can read things aloud to you from medication labels and food packaging. And it has a number of other functionalities as well. And we also showed her some standalone OCR technology um, with these individual devices that will scan a document and read it aloud to her. So for this patient with profound visual field loss, sensory substitution or using auditory instead of visual information was most appropriate because she had such a high level of frustration and so much field loss that prohibited her from finding her way around. We next talked to our patient about her emotional adjustment to vision loss. Um, given the severity of her emotional adjustment and how much trouble she was having and her level of depression, she fortunately already had a referral put through to psychiatry. So we counseled her on the importance of following up on that referral and making sure that she's seen and managed so that she can start feeling better. Um, we also talked with her about the prognosis of visual field loss from strokes. Um, and the importance of continued care. And we plan to repeat her visual field tests in a few months. And the reason for this is because spontaneous recovery or you know, gaining back a bit of lost visual field has been documented in patients with homonymous hemianopia. And our patient essentially has two homonymous hemianopias at once. When spontaneous recovery occurs, it's described as a small area of recovery. It's not like patients are getting back a large amount of visual field, and it's been described as a finger-like extension. Uh, research has shown that it's more commonly seen in lower and temporal crescents. Um, and here we can see a visual field from a different patient that I saw. So this is not the same patient. Um, this is another patient who initially had a complete right homonymous hemianopia, and then the areas that are circled by that yellow um, oval, that's the area that the patient regained over time. So that is the area of spontaneous recovery where they previously had no perception in that area. Now they at least have a little bit. So time goes by, our patient left, our, we made our recommendations, and she comes back nine months later feeling that her vision has in fact improved since our last low vision exam. She's still struggling with reading and she's doing a little bit more with her daily living activities and her mobility is really improving as she's getting out there more and getting some help from a physical therapy therapist who's doing some support with um, her muscular strength and training. 
Uh, she's doing much better emotionally with good support from her psychologist and is really much improved. And at this visit, her acuities are stable. Her contrast sensitivity is 1.16, which is maybe a couple of letters better than at that last visit. But the biggest change we saw at this visit was that while she still had profound constriction in the superior right and left visual field and the inferior right visual field, her inferior left field was now full. So we saw her visual fields before. This is what they looked like initially. And then at this follow-up visit, she now had this area in her inferior left field that she had gained back. So you can see this area where she had some spontaneous recovery in the left eye as well as in the right eye in that same spot. So she now has this wedge of vision where she previously barely had any vision. Uh, so we were quite happy to find this. Um, we then evaluated her reading using the continuous text reading card again. And here she demonstrated good speed and fluency, an enormous improvement from her last visit, um, likely related to that recovery of visual field. She was able to make it down to 1.3 M sized print, which is just a little bit larger than newspaper sized print. And we evaluated different reading ads with her. She ultimately preferred a plus four ad, which allowed her to get down to 0.8 M, which is a little bit smaller than newspaper print. And she was receptive to using this device when she didn't have other options. However, she was really keen on using a handheld magnifier and with a six diopter illuminated hand magnifier, she was able to read down to 0.5M or half the size of newspaper print. And she was thrilled. Um, she read some medication labels that were available for her to evaluate in the office. She read some different packaging and instructions, and she was really excited about this hand magnifier. So at the conclusion of our follow-up visit, we educated our patient on the improvement in vision that had truly happened for her, and that while we didn't expect any further improvement, we were so pleased that improvement had occurred. Uh, we recommended a set of reading glasses for reading a large print Bible with direct task lighting. Um, given her decreased contrast sensitivity, she really does need that lighting to compensate for how washed out things look, and she needs that brightness in order to see well. She also obtained the six diopter hand magnifier. Um, she was so excited she didn't want to leave the clinic without it, and we recommended continued daily living skills training. So from this patient, we can see that functional goals can be achieved different ways, but it depends on the level of visual field loss. Initially, this patient had profound constriction in a scenario where visual reading just was not realistic for her. However, over time, with a little bit of luck and a little bit of spontaneous recovery, she was actually able to read visually using low levels of magnification. It's really important to maximize central vision for patients with field loss and to recommend devices where we can. So to conclude from today, visual field loss can occur from a range of ocular conditions and this has significant impacts on patient's function that we've spent some time discussing today. It's critical to determine patient's functional goals in order to direct where we're going during a low vision exam. Orientation and mobility instruction can be really critical in order to help patients find their way around and avoid trips, bumps, falls, and restriction of their activities. And there are other interventions that we need to think about. We want to make sure that we optimize distance vision through refractive correction. Uh, we want to provide the lowest level of magnification possible to uh, re required to accomplish a desired task. And we should also think about whether patients are struggling to perform their daily living activities and recommend training if necessary. So I'd like to thank you for your attention today. And I guess we can now open the floor to any questions. So I'm seeing a question about why I opted for a Goldman and not an automated perimetry test. Um, I think this is probably related to the first case that we discussed today. Um, so for that patient, he had, um, sorry, she had some pretty severe visual field loss. She was 2320. So we felt that given the severity of her, her visual acuity loss, she might have difficulty um, seeing the small fixation target and maintaining fixation. 
Additionally, the fixation monitoring feature in a Humphrey visual field was unlikely to work for this patient because of her nystagmus. Um, it would not be able to track her eye because her eye was constantly moving around. Um, Goldman visual fields are also nice for low vision patients who might have difficulty responding in standard ways to the Humphrey visual field because you can kind of modify it to suit that patient's visual needs further. And, you know, if they have any comorbidities that make them slow to respond, you can factor that in and present targets slower. And they also provide a larger field diameter that they assess. A Humphrey visual field, you know, a 30-2 is only going to assess the 30 degrees on either side of fixation, whereas the Goldman visual field really assesses the full hill of vision and gets all the way out into the far periphery. So it gives you a more comprehensive idea of um, any visual field loss. Um, there was another somewhat related question about um, different visual field tests. So I was asked, do you perform a 10-2 Humphrey visual field on patients with gross field loss to make sure you evaluate the central 10 degrees in more detail? That's a great question. Um, so it does depend on the patient. Um, I'm a little picky with my visual field test choices. Um, a 10-2 is a great option, especially for those patients who have, you know, that very small, less than 20 degree diameter. Um, it's particularly helpful, helpful for our end-stage glaucoma patients where you want to make sure that you're, you know, assessing for any changes in the visual field in great detail in that very small area. Um, I've seen a couple of questions about reverse telescopes. Um, so a reverse telescope is essentially um, a telescope held backwards. Um, so rather than enlarging what you're looking at and magnifying the view, um, it minifies it and makes it smaller. Um, there are also some kind of standalone reverse telescopes or minifiers that, um, you know, work this same way, um, that they're, you know, designed more for that task. Um, I see a question about the difference between using prismatic magnifiers from non-prismatic magnifiers. Uh, so in the cases we discussed today, there were a couple who used um, uh, strong ads with prism, and the prism is put into the glasses base in, so it's shifting the image out. So there's base in prism in front of each eye. And by shifting the image out, the patient will not need to converge their eyes as much to focus on the things that are up close, because if you bring reading material closer, the patient's eyes need to pull closer together in order to have binocular single vision. So by using that prism in the glasses, it pushes the image outward so that they don't need to um, work quite so hard to converge to that distance. Um, I'm seeing a question about how to know how, man, how many diopters to prescribe for a magnifier. Um, there's a number of different ways to do it, and there are a couple of really great lectures from my colleagues on the um, CyberSight library from past low vision lectures. Um, I usually use the inverse of the critical print size to determine my starting point. So if a patient's last good smooth fluent reading was holding the print material at 10 centimeters and they read 1M, um, I would do 1M divided by 0.1 to get my, uh, my predicted add. Um, I'm seeing a question, if a patient has trembling, what device is best? So if a patient has a hand tremor or is unable to hold things stable, they might have difficulty using a hand magnifier um, where things move around. If, you know, if you're holding a magnifier and your hand is shaking, it's hard to keep that view. Um, so stand magnifiers may be more appropriate here. There are also patients who have head tremors where their head moves, but their hand is just fine. And these patients might not do as well with spectacle-based approaches and might do better with kind of hand stuff. Um, 
Uh, so I'm seeing a question about assessing visual fields in children. Um, this is definitely a challenging endeavor. I think it depends on the age and the maturity level of the child. Um, some children, you know, are able to do a Goldman visual field. If you reframe the question a little bit, you know, you're, you're uh, zapping spaceships or you're catching fairies or, you know, you give them some alternative way to think about it so that it makes it more of a game. Um, there are a few publications out there about different methods to assess visual fields in children. Um, in our clinic, we commonly use a flicker wand, which is um, really just a um, light at the end of a stick that we use to do kind of a modified confrontation field test, um, but engaging the, the child in a game-like approach for assessing visual fields seems to be useful. Um, I'm seeing a question about why cataract is a major cause of low vision. Um, nearly everyone develops cataract to some extent past a certain point in life. It's just kind of a yellowing of the lens inside of the eye. Um, so it's very common for this to occur in people of all ages. UV exposure in older ages, excuse me, um, UV exposure increases the risk of cataract. So that can further progress the condition. Um, and it, you know, Cataract surgery, fortunately, is very effective in resolving vision loss from cataract. Um, I'm seeing another question, um, comment. Um, people with progressive field loss, it can be helpful to introduce sensory substitution and orientation and mobility training early, which is absolutely true. I firmly agree with that. Um, Sometimes the challenge is getting patients to accept orientation and mobility training earlier on. There can be some stigma and some reluctance to accept mobility training in patients with field loss um, because they don't want to be identified as having a visual impairment. Um, without a white cane, they look just like anyone else walking down the street, and you would never know that they're visually impaired. So sometimes that slows patients' acceptance of orientation and mobility training. Um, and certainly introducing sensory substitution and, you know, encouraging patients to use um, optical character recognition software along with visual information while they're able can be useful. Um, a lot of times in my younger patients with RP, um, especially those with significant computer and vocational goals, I might recommend using built in um, read aloud functions in, you know, their different softwares so that as they're writing papers or as they're editing reports, they can do some of it from an auditory perspective and others visually and kind of integrate those two together. Um, there's a question, can handheld magnifiers be beneficial in end-stage glaucoma with very minimal vision? Um, I think it depends on the level of minimal vision. Um, I do have patients with end-stage glaucoma who might use a hand magnifier to you know, check little tiny things, but they have a way to use their vision. If they have profound field loss and their acuity is profoundly reduced, we might be limited in hand magnifiers because, you know, you can only get up to a certain level with a hand magnifier. And especially in glaucoma, contrast sensitivity is often reduced. So these patients might benefit more from a portable electronic magnifier that can also make things brighter and bolder. Um, I've seen a few questions about patients with hemianopia. And while my last uh, case in this presentation admittedly did have hemianopia, um, I didn't really want to focus on that in this presentation today because it's kind of a separate set of interventions. Um, for patients with hemianopia, the preferred choice for managing mobility concerns is uh, peripheral or peliprisms, which are segmental prisms that um, sit that fit on the patient's glasses in a specific way. Um, there's a ton of research backing their use and they're, you know, very, very useful. Um, but some patients have trouble learning how to use them as they take some training and adaptation. All right. Well, I think that's it for today. Thank you all for your attention and for joining me.